So why am I teaching a class on Islamic style bookbinding, specifically medieval Islamic style bookbinding? Uh, so I'm a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, or the SCA. I may mention that throughout the class occasionally. Um, if you're interested, if you don't know what that is and you want to know, let me know and I will put you in touch with someone who can explain it better than I can. Um, but the point is that we recreate medieval stuff because it's fun. Uh, at least that's why I do it. Um, and why Islamic style stuff? Well, because it's pretty, quite honestly. Um, I've always been fascinated about by it and I found a whole bunch of good resources for Islamic style bookbinding. Um, I can show you some of them. So this one's one of my favorites. Um, and all of these are in the class notes uh, in the references section. Um, that one's got a whole bunch of detail. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, front page. This one's also a really good one. I have no idea if you can read that. Hopefully you can. But like I said, they're in the class notes, so you can always look them up later. This one's great if you want to know the actual like materials and stuff. This one's been super helpful for that. Um, and then this is the other one I've got. And then there's one other that's very expensive to find in print, but there's a free PDF online. So that's been super helpful as well. Um, if the link is not already in my blog post, I will add it later. Um, all right. So, uh, so the intent of this class is to kind of walk you through, demonstrate the different steps because, um, just reading it can be a little hard to interpret what it means and pictures are only so good when you're trying to like do and photograph and I only have two hands. So, and my cat has four paws but isn't able to hold a phone uh, to take pictures. So it's just me. And so I figured a video might be a little easier and an interactive video at least lets you ask questions when you have them. So hopefully I can answer them real time. Um, so what are we making? We're making a book, um, just at least while well, I'm making a book. Um, this isn't really designed as a follow along, but if people are interested in that, let me know and I can try that. I have to figure out how best to do it, but we can try that. Um, but I'm just gonna show you. So Islamic style books look something kind of like this. Um, they commonly have an envelope flap, which is this part here. And then a lot of them also have a forage flap, which is this part here. Technically all of them have a foredge, it just isn't always stiffened with a flap. Um, they have end bands, which might be a little difficult to see, but I thought of that. Technology is great, great and wonderful. So they have woven end bands, usually in a chevron or striped pattern around a leather core. That's going to be next class is going to be going over how to make that part. Um, so class number one is preparing the text block, which is this right here. No covers, no nothing, no, no end bands, um, mostly because the end bands take over 30 minutes all by themselves. Uh, so they get their own dedicated class. Um, and I mean, it's pretty much similar to a modern hardcover hardback book, except it's got the fun little flap. And technically the fun little flap is optional. Um, the purpose it serves is to help protect this edge of the paper from dust or anything when it's being stored, which as you can see is a really good idea. It's kind of got its own little mini box built in, in the form of the cover. Um, so, uh, so this is a three class series. Like I said, today we're doing making the text block. Next time we'll do the end band and then the third class will be finishing all the rest of it. Um, I'm going to be kind of showing you in fits and starts different things rather than taking one whole book from beginning to end because glue takes a while to dry. So I have prepared a number of books in various stages that I'm going to pick up and work on as we go. Uh, so some tools that are particularly useful. Uh, this is called an awl. Um, if you can't find an awl, um, a thin nail, small little like brad, I think they're usually called, works fine. That's what I was using before I got an awl. Bone folder, very good for making nice pretty creases in your paper and also for smoothing the cover out when you glue it on. A brayer can also be used for smoothing the cover out when you put it on. 
Um, rolling cutter is great for cutting paper. It's my favorite. Um, what other tools? Oh, uh, book press. So they had two different styles of book press. This is the one we'll be using first. Um, I wrap mine in parchment paper so that I don't get glue on them. Um, but it's basically just two fairly skinny blocks of wood. Uh, I bolt mine together because we have modern hardware and it's great. Uh, they would basically use a rope to tie it together to tension it down, but this works a lot better. Um, and is super easy. And we'll get to that one hopefully at the end of this class. And then there's also a, it's called a screw press. And I'm actually using it as a camera stand. So let me gently take this and flip it around. Uh, there we go. Sorry about the fan. Uh, note the screw on top. And it's kind of covered in stuff because it's a, taking up half my workspace. Uh, so it gets used as shelves. Um, mine's a particularly large one because I want to do, I make, I want to make large sketchbooks. So I needed a large book press. Most of them are about, only about that big for small books. Um, all right. So questions so far, post them in the chat. If you do, if you have the ability to post in the chat, otherwise shoot me an email, and I'll get them, get to them later. Um, do, 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 do. All right, I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll get started. If, like I said, if you've got questions, go ahead and shout them out. So for prepping the pages, um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can either fold them or cut them and then fold them. Uh, regardless, you will wind up doing both cutting and folding at some point. Um, the order you do it in is basically personal preference. There's pros and cons to each. Um, so if you're folding it, uh, it's quattrofolio technically, I think is the term, but basically you're folding it twice. Um, so I tend to fold it and then smooth it down with the bone folder to make a nice pretty crease. And then you fold it again. And since you're just folding it in half each time, you don't have to like measure or anything fancy. So that's helpful too. Um, one of the cons is that you sometimes get rough, I don't know how well you can see that with the lighting being what it is, but rough little like wrinkles in the paper. I'm sure people who are better at this could not have that problem, but I've made about six of these little books and I found that this was not my favorite way of doing it. My favorite way of doing it is this. And because I'm a quilter and have a quilting square, I make my own life easier on myself. So midpoint of an 11 would be five and a half. I think I would remember that off the top of my head, but somehow I managed not to. So rolly cutter. Um, the nice thing about this is you can actually do a larger stack of paper this way. You basically just continuously lightly roll the rolly cutter over it. And eventually you cut all the way through all the pages. So cut it in half first and then fold it in half. Um, one of the perks in this way is you don't have to cut them when you're done. Um, so like this one, when I'm done, I'm going to end up having to cut this edge, this edge here when I'm done. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's really easy to find the center of each of these. Um, this is one gathering or signature in some styles is what it's called. You're getting a ton of lag. Yes, this video will be available later. Um, I'm going to see about posting it on YouTube. Uh, how many sheets of paper in each group? Um, so I'm ending up with, I'm going to end up with four sheets or eight pages. I know that I don't think I'm using the terminology quite correct. It's a little confusing, the terminology. Different people call things different things. Um, but basically you can think of a page as either this is a page and that's a page and that's a page, or you can think of it as this is a page and this is a page. I don't really care. The point is I'm doing four of these little things or two sheets of paper folded together for this book. Um, with the thicker paper, I find that four is kind of the maximum. Um, with paper this thin, I could have gone more, but I'm used to doing four. Um, for really thick paper, you would only do like two or three. Uh, it kind of depends on the thickness of your paper. Um, 
Um, I, and y yes, I think Twitch archives it for some amount of time, but I am planning on posting it to YouTube or something. I will figure it out and I will post a link. Um, okay, so those are kind of your two options for making the gatherings. So uh, signatures, choirs, the, uh, the primary book I reference calls them gatherings, so the gatherings. What weight of paper do I prefer? Uh, I honestly should know the answer to that, but I don't. I generally use um, like sketch paper or watercolor paper, um, whatever weight paper that is. I, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thicker than, than computer paper is what I normally use, but computer paper works great, especially if you're just learning it because it's super cheap and most people already have it in their houses. All right, so once we've folded, Next step is to punch the holes that we're going to sew through. Um, to do that, we need the other piece of equipment that I've been hiding down here. Uh, it's called a punching cradle. Mine's super wonky because I made it myself. Um, and I didn't quite get things even and lined up and stuff. But it works well enough and eventually I will get a nicer one. Um, basically all it is is a couple of pieces of wood or thick cardboard if you want to make your own wedged in at a 90 degree angle to each other with a very thin gap in the middle where the paper is going to get punched through and ideally the gap is about the same width as your awl mine's slightly thicker on this end and basically perfect on that end so we're going to try and use that end did i line this up no i lined it up for the other way oops around um so in order to know where to punch, because you want them to be punched in the same place on each gathering, I make a template. I labeled the template for you. I don't usually bother. Um, basically, I use scrap pieces of mail, because why would I use anything else? Um, they're just going to go in the recycle anyway. Uh, so I note where the head and the tail are. That's the top and bottom of the book. I mark where the midpoint is. You are not punching a hole here. And then um, I generally do about a third-ish of the length of the spine as the distance between the two punch points. Um, so in medieval Islamic bookmaking, they almost always did two um, stations is what they're called. Uh, there was occasionally four, and then at the very end of the medieval period, they started experimenting with three or five. But two was by far the most common. And it's one of the easiest sewing patterns, so I recommend starting with two. So for this to work, you basically put your paper gathering in, all, all, all sheets of the gathering stacked together, placed in here. Place your template, take your all, line it up with the marks on your template, and punch it. Very simple, very easy. When you're doing lots of them, it's also very time consuming. Uh, let's see, is this better? Sort of. Just got a little hole. And we're going to sew through it later. Works the same for the other style. Um, the nice thing, another pro for folding them all together and then cutting them later is uh, that the, all the pages stay together and they don't move around. The downside is cutting them later is a little annoying. Um, and it generally leaves you with a slightly raggy edge. Uh, so like I said, my, my punching cradle is a little bit janky so it it doesn't punch quite as nicely as it should, but someday I'll get a nice one. It works all right. All right. So now I've got these. Um, where, where's... All right. So like I said, I have my things ready to go here. I haven't labeled them for myself. This one's for starting sewing. All right. So. When you're sewing these, I'm actually not going to do that one because these are all, yeah, these are all cut already. You stack all your, all your gatherings together. This will form your text block when you're done. So for thread, uh, in period they use silk. So I use silk. Uh, linen is more common in European book binding, but you can use it. Um, if you want. And then um, 
I end up using embroidery needles because they're easier to thread. And I have lots of them because I embroider. So, uh, this one's actually not for today. That one's for the end band. All right, so the amount of thread that you need is, actually I'm gonna do it this way so you can see. Basically, fold an amount as a tail off to the side, and then you're gonna measure between the two holes, and then you're gonna do that the same number of signatures you've got, or gatherings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then I really hate running out of thread while I'm going, so I do an extra couple. And then you double it. Um, so in the like one instruction manual that we still have, uh, they say to at least double it, um, sometimes triple it or quadruple it. I think that largely depends on the how thick your thread is and how big your holes are. Um, oh, what weight of silk? Uh, so this is embroidery. No, this is not embroidery silk. This is sewing silk. Um, you the same? Yeah, you're the same person who asked about the weight of the paper. I will try and figure out what I got and get back to you. Um, so I will say that this stuff I bought specially, but this I bought at Joann's. It's also silk thread. It's by Guterman. Uh, it works all right, but this one I generally triple because it's a little bit thinner. Um, let me see if I can do a good side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Come on, I only want one. I only want one strand. Only one strand, please. No, not at all. Wrong end. Okay, that's why. All right, so let's see how well we can see this on the camera with the uh, magnifying glass. See problem, right? Nope, come on. So I don't know if you can tell this side's the Guterman, this side's not. Um, so the Guterman's a little bit thinner. So like I said, I usually triple it or quadruple it. Um, a lot of times it just kind of depends on the thickness of the paper and how big you punch the hole. Um, the, the all I have is tapered. So the deeper you punch, the bigger the hole's gonna be. Um, you don't want super giant holes, generally speaking, because then you need super giant thread to not pull through the holes. Um, honestly, whatever weight you have, if you can thread it through the eye of a normal needle, is probably fine. Um, I was buying silk anyway for another project, so I went ahead and bought nice, pretty, fancy silk in the three most common colors I find in heraldry in the SDA. <laughs> At least here where we are. Um, where'd my scissors go? Lost my scissors. Oh yeah, scissors, another indispensable tool. Hilariously enough, they are actually called out in the bookbinding manuals. They're called shears, but, so they did exist back then. All right, um, and then you just tie a knot, really simple overhand knot, tie it however you prefer. Um, generally, you'll have to double or triple it. The goal here is that you need a knot that's bigger than the hole you punched in your paper, otherwise the knot will pull through your paper. Um, pretty standard how that goes. Uh, let's do one more and that should be fine. Uh, you are gonna kinda anchor it so it doesn't have to not pull through ever, it just has to not pull through for the first little while, but here we go. All right, and then trim it really close to the knot. Don't cut the knot. All right, we're gonna see how well this next part actually shows up on the video camera, so hopefully this works. So, you're gonna stab through from the outside to the inside to the middle. Make sure that you don't accidentally stab through to like the first page or something. So all the way through all of them in a gathering to the middle. Pick a hole, any hole, it really doesn't matter. Um, if, if you're not doing a blank book and you've done like text on the paper beforehand, which is technically how they would make them, um, you do actually have to care and you have to make sure everything's in order before you start sewing, but it's the nice thing about blank journals that people are going to write in later is it doesn't matter. So basically pull it until the knot's just sort of chilling out there on the outside. Try not to pull too hard or you might accidentally pull it through anyway. 
And then it's really simple, honestly, even for people who don't really do sewing much. You go to the other hole and you go out the other hole. You pull tight, like that. And then you take the next one. And again, because it doesn't matter which side's top or which side's bottom, you just pick a hole and you go into it. So the other fun part about a two hole, a two station sewing is because it really doesn't matter. And then you go out the other side. And this is when it starts getting fun and a little bit more tricky. So we're going to anchor the two together because otherwise they're just going to be kind of flopping all over the place. So for the first one, you're going to take a little knot and pull it out just a little bit so that you can see the threads. So part of the reason you do two here is that this works. And you go in between the threads. So let's see how well this is showing up. Doo -doo -doo -doo. There's my camera. So needle goes in between the threads that form the knot. And then you pull it. And then you pull it tight. You pull out all that slack that I just put into it. And see, they slide less. They at least aren't flapping all over the place. Um, so a downside of Islamic book binding as opposed to European book binding um, is that the text block itself tends to be much looser and more floppy until you glue it which is why gluing it is basically the step right after making the text block. All right, so next step. Oh, wow, is it already almost six o'clock? All right, we're gonna move a little bit more quickly. Um, next step is you go into the next one and then back out the hole. And then we're gonna do the more normal thing that you will do for the rest of these. And you see this little stitch here? that connects the previous two gatherings. You're gonna go under that with the needle. There you are, there's my camera. You keep losing track of where my camera is. And you're gonna go through. Doo -doo -doo. And, um, so one of the common tricks to prevent this is to rub your thread in beeswax before you start. Uh, I don't actually have beeswax. Um, given how much I sew, I probably should, but I don't. Um, and then, finish this out and provide it a little bit more stability, you're going to go back through this loop that you're currently making, like this, and you're going to pull tight, like that. I don't know how well you can see that, but there you go. Um, and that, again, the, the tighter you pull, the less the page, the gatherings move around relative to each other. You don't want to pull super, super tight because the thread can still like cut the paper. Um, if you don't believe me, give it a try. <laughs> um, but do pull kind of taut as you work. And then you just keep going. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And you go in the next one and you go across the middle and you go out that side and you pull kind of taut. And then I always go from the inside out um, because it gives a more consistent C to the stitches, but I don't know that it actually matters. And then you pull top. So we're building the text block, one gathering at a time. Um, for a really thick book, you're likely to run out of thread at some point. Um, you can tie in new thread. I personally hate doing that, so I don't make really thick books, but it's something I'm sure I'll eventually have to learn how to do. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to get up underneath it, especially if you've done a nice good taut stitch prior to that, so I find it's useful to just sort of, come here, you do what you're supposed to, poke it out the end, which normally it does, um, so a long needle can be helpful for that. But usually you can get it to just kind of flick off this end and pull it tight. And then you keep doing this. All right. Any additional questions so far?
Does this make perfect sense to everybody? Do you need me to do it slower, closer to the camera? Come on. All right, just, just, all right, fine. So, like I said, if the needle gets lost, you can just sort of pry the pages apart and find it. It's not gonna hurt the pages, as long as you do it gently. A curved needle? Uh, yeah, that would probably work. Um, I will have to try and dig out my curved needle sometime and give that a try. In theory, I have some buried somewhere in my workshop. Um, the, the books that I found on the subject don't mention the use of curved needles in period, and I do try and do historical accuracy with my methods, if not always my materials. Um, I have actually made a book, a couple books with more period materials. So in the Islamic period, they would have, for paper, they would have used paper made from hemp or linen. Um, those are very difficult to find these days. There is a paper maker that I know of in India who still makes hemp paper in the traditional style, but that's, that's the only one I've been able to find. Um, so. Like I said, just watercolor or sketch paper generally works fine, depending on what you want to use the book for. If you just want it for a regular, normal, just jot notes down notebook, computer paper, or slightly thicker, like resume paper, works great. Um, if you want to use it as a sketchbook or to write on it with a quill or um, anything like that, um, I'm losing the appropriate ter term for that. Or, like do calligraphy in it, um, you'd need a thicker paper that, that handles that better. Um, but yeah, so um, but yeah, so uh, like a cloth rag paper is the most appropriate for the medieval period. Um, they didn't really use trees for paper. They didn't have good processes for that as much back then. There is a link. On the oh, I should post a link on the blog for sourcing period materials. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, <laughs> I have not done that. I, I will see about doing that. Um, I do have an entire blog post dedicated to the as period as possible book that I made. Um, I did an embroidered velvet cover and everything. We will talk more about cover materials in the third class. Resume paper. Resume paper comes in a linen finish. I've never found resume paper made with actual linen, but if you do, please by all means send me a link because that would be awesome. So linen finish is a very popular like fancy paper thing, but it's generally not made with actual linen. It just looks like linen when they're done with it. All right, so. I'm actually going to set this one aside now because I'm going to add a few more gatherings to it before we're done, before I'm done. Go over there. Go over there. And I'm going to show you the finishing steps on this one. Um, so this one, this is one I started previously. Note, I love switching thread colors all the time. All right, so this is one I did with the, the folded pages. And as you can see, I sort of creased it. I don't know if you can actually see that, but I creased it kind of badly when I was folding it, which is why I prefer to cut them first and then fold, but that's a personal preference. And my cat has started wondering what I'm doing. Hopefully he will not interrupt us. All right, so when you're done, you do the same little stitch that you do normally pull it tight, and then you go back into the hole you came out of. Doo, 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 doo. Back into the hole. And then you wrap it around the long stitch, like that, and then back through the loop. If you do this right. Come on, out of it. Like that. There is a special name for this stitch, and I've forgotten it. It's lost on the tip of my tongue. Um, and it's just, you pull it tight as a knot. Um, in some cases I've seen reference to, you actually do this, I think it's for the, the odd numbered 
stations. Um, you actually do this on each and every stitch, uh, but that's sort of a, you can do it, you don't have to. It's optional. And then I, for extra security, knot it again on the outside. I figure I've already got one little knotty bump thing here. I may as well have a matching one on the other side. Um, so I'll just kind of tie a basic knot around the, th the thread. But again, that's optional. The knot you just tied should be enough to hold it. But this makes me feel better. Also, you're gonna glue the heck out of this thing. So it ain't going nowhere. And then you trim it as close as possible. So, like I said, there is, it's still kind of loose and wobbly and moves relative to each other, which is not exactly conducive to the long-term durability of a book. It does make it very easy to open, which is, you know, nice, but again, that's, if it's that easy to open, it's really easy to tear the threads connecting it, and then you lose the pages. So, what are you gonna do? You're gonna glue it. So, options for glue. Um, this is common modern bookbinding glue. It's called PVA. It's pH neutral, so it's archival. Um, it's great for if you want it to last and not dissolve eventually. Uh, a more period option, which is still available today, is there we go. Glue made from wheat starch. Um, it's really very simple. You mix uh, this with water at a specific ratio. You microwave it, and it turns into this like slurry thing. Um, the downside of this is that, like anything made from wheat and cooked, uh, it will eventually mold. So use it within the you know a few days of making it. Store it in the fridge. The usual things you do to keep leftovers good. All right. So I'm actually gonna yeah this one's thicker. So I was gonna glue this one. Like I said, I made like all of them to various stages so that I could show you guys all the different steps. And I made this one slightly thicker so you can actually see really well how this works. So we have, I'm gonna prop it up. So that, normally I do this on my lap because there's that whole downside of when, well, you're gonna see, the book's gonna be sticking out of both ends for at least a little while. But since you need to be able to see, we're doing it up here. So you loosen your press. Um, so, you can buy this, or you can buy a, like, I think they're woodworkers clamps, or I went to my local hardware store and I bought a thing of wood, one of the like hobby pieces of wood, sawed it in half, drilled a couple holes in it, and got some bolts and wing nuts, and made myself one for much, much cheaper than it cost to buy them. Um, I recommend doing that if you have the drill to be able to drill holes through giant thick pieces of wood. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this in here with about two finger worth sticking out. And then we're gonna clamp it in. That slid a little. Okay. Downside of this is that you have to kind of hold it in place while you twist. Really, bookbinders need like four hands, at least three. But sadly, we only have the two to work with. So, if you have a buddy, I suggest getting help from a buddy, but I don't, so I manage. And then you screw it in tight. Come on, screw in. That's the reason I have the wing nuts, because I can do those one-handed. Alright, the other thing you want to check, and I haven't done a good job of it yet, but we're about to, is you want to make sure that everything's lined up and is not this like weird kind of raggy thing that I got going on here. So do the mom of twins. Yes, I'm the the mom the mother of any children need like eight arms per child, honestly. All right, so you kind of jiggle them around, make sure that they're lined up even, mostly straight. Um, the better a job you do now, the less you have to try and finagle it after the glue is in, and once the glue is in, it doesn't want to move. Um, so in, in, the, uh, in the explanations from period, they recommend you sit there and you count each of the signatures or gatherings on each side and make sure the numbers add up. I tend to trust that I have sewn them tightly enough together that one of them is not going to go slipping in, but if you want to do that, 
for yourself, that's probably not a terrible idea. Uh, I don't bother. All right, so one of the fun things with working with wheat starch glue is that the easiest way to apply it is literally just put some on your fingers and glop it on. And then pretend you're finger painting. Um, so I have wrapped my press in parchment paper because that way the glue gets on the parchment paper and then I just take the parchment paper off as opposed to having to try and clean glue off of wood, which is best done with sandpaper. And I don't have any at the moment, so. And then you smear it in and you wanna try and make sure it gets down in between the gatherings at least a little bit. Not like all the way down between the gatherings, that's why it's clamped in here while we do this. Um, but just a little ways, it helps provide stability and structure. Um, you can also do this with the PVA glue, although with the PVA glue it tends to be thinner, so I recommend just doing it with a paintbrush. Um, preferably a paintbrush you don't like, because no matter how much you try and clean it, it will never completely be glue free ever again. Ask me how I know. And then when you're kind of done with this, clap it all, make sure it's all in there. And then I wipe off whatever excess I can get off my fingers back into the jar. Um, it's handy to have paper towels or napkins or tissues or something to wipe your hands with. And because you're going to need it in a second. All right. So you've got the glue all nice and glommed on there. Oh, I've got a giant bit of it off the side, don't I? All right, let's not have that. All right, then you're going to loosen the press. Looks like there may be a big glob of... Yep. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, that's not what you're going for, but I'm trying to show you more than I am trying to do it the way that works best for me, so it seems to be working all right. And then you slide it down, and this is the part where you can kind of like re-make sure everything's lined up correctly. You slide it down so that the edges the end of the edge of your spine. Oh, so this is the spine, by the way. I didn't really go over that. I probably should do super quick terminology. All right. Spine, head, tail. I referenced those a few times. Um, so slide it down so that the spine of your book is roughly even. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect, but try and get it close to the edges, so there should be pretty much smoothness across here. And then re-tighten. And as you tighten, maybe you can see this, the glue should start to sort of ooze and squeeze up because you have deprived it of the space in which it was existing. Go, what do you, what's going on? Sorry. My phone is doing something it wasn't supposed to be doing. The wheat starch glue stays wet. Um, after a few days, it will start to like break down um, and become very liquidy and not very goopy. So like I said, whatever batch you make, use within a week. Um, shorter amounts of time if you live in a hot, humid climate and don't keep it in the fridge because it will mold faster than that. Um, the nice thing is that like, this was, this is about half of a batch from a table, a uh, teaspoon of wheat starch glue. So like this is not very expensive and it makes you a lot of glue. Just make small amounts at a time in a microwave safe dish, one that you can seal preferably. Um, and keep an eye on it when you microwave it because it will go everywhere. Kind of like oatmeal. It's like making oatmeal. It just goes everywhere if you don't keep an eye on it. All right. So I squeeze it down really tight. A whole bunch of glue is, I, I don't know how well you can see this, but the pictures on the blog actually do a decent job of, of showing you all the glue that's squeezed out. And then you just sort of take it off. See, see this is how much glue I squeezed out. It's a lot. And then I save it. Oh, um, it, how long it takes to dry um, once you've applied it 
Depends. Uh, depends on the climate you live in, mostly. If you live somewhere humid, it will take longer. I now live in the desert. It honestly is fairly dry within a couple of hours. Um, but it also depends on how thickly you're applying it. So for this stage, where you end up wiping off a good chunk of it, uh, it dries pretty quick. Um, I also use it for the cover, and that one takes a little longer because I've applied it a bit more thickly. You could potentially make wheat starch on the stove if you were doing a large enough batch. But like I said, this tiny amount in the jar is about half of a batch from a teaspoon. So that's about the most I make at one time, unless I am rapid fire making a lot of books all in one go in like the matter of a few days. Um, and then it, you can't really even see the glue anymore, but trust me, it's there. It's very helpful and it will help a lot. And I'll show you. So set this aside, let it dry. Um, I usually let them dry for about eight hours just because like I, I do it before bed and then let it dry overnight or I do it in the morning and then come back to it in the evening or whatever, but that's me. So when the glue has dried, we'll end up looking something like this. And as you can see, like there is no more sliding at all. These pages will not slide against each other. And you can more or less open it almost all the way, but you, you can't open it so much that you can see the thread through it anymore. Um, so that's very helpful. So that's what it's gonna look like when it's dry. So the next step um, is we're gonna line the spine. And the spine lining um, serves a couple of purposes, functions. One, it helps anchor for the end bands that we're gonna sew. Um, two, it provides additional stability and structure because we're gonna glue this to the spine lining. So it's gonna be another layer of glue onto something that's helping provide structure. Um, and it also helps attach these to the cover. So we'll actually show you a quick preview the next couple of steps. Like I said, I made little sample books in various stages. So this is what the spine lining is gonna look like once it's glued on. Um, and again, with that whole two finger thing, because they didn't have standard measurements, they recommend about two fingers worth of extra to be used. It's probably a little excessive for a book this small, but I figured may as well. And then um, we're gonna glue the cover boards onto it. So, so this is what the spine lining is also useful for. It helps attach the cover boards and provides a flexible hinge for the boards to open and close. And then we're going to glue a cover onto it, which again provides additional hinging of the cover boards. Um, and then we're going to attach the like borage flap and the envelope flap. We're going to fold the cover in like that, and then we're going to line it. So all of that will be in the next couple of classes but I figured I'd give you a quick sneak preview. Do, 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 do. All right, so. Next step is actually cutting the spine lining. Actually, next step is I need water. Okay, so the spine lining, I found references to linen, which seem to be pretty common and popular. Um, I've also found references to paper, which I've gotten kind of conflicting information out of the instructions, so I don't use the paper. Um, you're welcome to give it a try. I think the instructions for that one are in this book. Um, but uh, paper hinges are used in a slightly different way in modern day book binding and book, con book conservation mostly. Um, so a lot of the tools I have, I actually have because I learned how to repair books when I worked in a library in college. Um, and then, you know, a logical next step of course is making the books from scratch because it's fun. Um, and then leather. Uh, so leather is commonly used mostly with leather covers. I have yet to learn leather working. It is on the to-do list to someday learn. Um, but in the meantime, I don't work with leather, so I do all of this as cloth. So the covers are cloth, I use linen, but I would love to learn the leather style someday. 
as it is the much more, much, much better known. So for the spine lining, you're basically going to measure, you can also just, you know, measure it, but I find it easier to, you know, not script the measurements if you literally just do it this way. So you want a tiny bit of overlap. The spine lining is going to be just a slightly bit longer than your text block. And then my favorite thing ever, rolling cutter. Um, and then that's, that's simple. So I'd pre-cut a strip of linen to the correct width and I've just been slicing off pieces of it as I need them. So your spine lining is just a little bit longer, not much longer um, because it helps with the end band sewing to have just a little bit of a backstop to it. But if you have too much, then the end band gets a little wonky because then you're trying to like curl the linen over and then sew on top of it and it gets weird. So you need probably less than an eighth of an inch, just extra there. All right. Um, so the way that the instructions tell you to do it in period is you would put this back into the book press, the one that we just used, or you would honestly just not even bother taking it out to begin with. Um, but I take it out so I can clean off any like little random bits of glue that kind of got stuck on the parchment paper and um, end up kind of raggy. Uh, so I just trim those off with an X-Acto knife. So the way I do it is I basically just find a couple of things to help keep the book in place. This is my thread container. This is my needle container. They happen to be the perfect size. So back to your glue. You don't want as much this time. Um, so don't like goop it on. Well, I goop it on and then I spread it out, but you don't need as much as you did last time. And then you just sort of gently spread it. I'm sure you could do this with a paintbrush if you don't want to use your fingers, but I tried it. it. I decided it wasn't worth it. It's a little bit too thick to for most paintbrushes to be able to handle very well. And finger painting's fun. Come on, embrace your inner child. All right. Any more questions while I do this? kind of line the spine lining up so that it's you know roughly centered that's the other nice thing about having really wide uh, sides is that it doesn't matter if you don't get it quite centered um, so you have approximately the same amount of overlap on both sides and then I smooth it down with my fingers and then I usually smooth it again with the bone folder just to make sure that it's getting very good adhesion um, personal preference honestly Bone folders are really nice. You can technically do without, just, but they're very helpful. And then um, one thing you want to check is that you didn't get a whole bunch of like goopy glue on the sides in here. Nope. Oh, okay. Um, and I put gravity to work for me. And I press it into something hard and let it dry. Um, again, it probably only takes a couple hours to dry. I've never really timed it, so I don't know exactly. It, I'm sure it depends on climate. Um, I lived somewhere more humid before and it definitely took longer to dry than it does in the desert where I live now. Um, so something they use in modern day book binding. So any kind of linen honestly will work um, modern day book binding uses something called super, which is basically a very loose leaf, loose weave linen. It's almost like cheesecloth, but it's been stiffened. Um, so they use it the same way. It's to help protect the signatures, give them a little extra structure. Um, I think they use it in European book binding as well, but. I just use whatever scrap linen I have left over from other projects. Okay, uh, I think that's as far as I wanted to get tonight because the next step is the end band. So we've got about nine minutes left until the nominal end of the class, but we can go shorter or longer. So what 
other questions do you have? Did all of that make perfect sense? Or are you gonna rewatch the video a few times until it does? Or do you have questions you want me to address now? Or do you want me to go get my cat so you can meet him? How would the thickness of leather affect this final step? So bookbinding leather, I'll start with the leather one. Bookbinding leather is generally thinner than normal other like tooling leather. Um, I suspect that they use fairly thin leather for, uh, for the spine lining. Um, like I said, I haven't actually tried it yet, but this book has some pretty good pictures, so let's see if we can find one that'll show you what it looks like. Uh, while I'm at it, what is the purpose of the end band? So the end band, which as I showed you is the pretty, it's this thing here, um, has two. It's both decorative and functional. Um, it helps protect, it helps give additional, additional structure to the, the text block. Like I said, a lot of this is all about giving extra structure to the text block because individually the different pieces will slowly deteriorate so like the spine lining might deteriorate or the glue might deteriorate and I'm talking over like hundreds of years not in the next you know lifetime um, and so the more of them you have the the better the better it is to help keep them all together um, the more you use it um, so the end band you actually you're gonna stitch through the center of each gathering near the top or near the tail and near the head um, and anchor it that way. The secondary end band is basically decorative and to protect the threads of the primary end band. But we will get to that. Type my contact info and blog info into the chat. Uh, here, I'm gonna have my, I'm gonna give my moderator a second job. While I'm looking for this, you can type my contact info into the chat for everybody to see. Yeah, the linen ones were a lot more common. Um, they did occasionally use leather. I'm not finding any pictures in a quick look. All right, we'll get back to that. Um, so like you can see kind of sort of here in this old book, um, this, the cover has split and the spine lining is helping keep everything together. Um, in other instances, they've got in the book, like even the spine lining itself has split and is in two pieces. <laughs> I will throw the contact info up at the end again. Um, but yeah, so this is an extremely helpful book if you want to know how they did it. It's got a whole lot of examples from later medieval period. Um, so I definitely recommend this one. It is a little expensive though. So check your libraries when they open again. All right, bring the contact and go back. Um, if you found the Facebook page, you already have the WordPress. That's the blog. It's under class notes. Uh, if I want the info for person who does European leather books. Ooh, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons I went with uh, Islamic style bookbinding is that I was able to find books on the topic that walked me through how to make it. Um, but yeah, no, I would really love to learn leather bookbinding from anybody who's willing to teach it. Any other questions? Hopefully you'll be able to tune in to the other two classes in the series. All right, contact info is in the uh, chat now. <laughs> Um, so like I said, next class we're going over the, the end band sewing, and then the third one will be finishing the book, adding the cover. Um, and hopefully in that one I will have a chance to go over how to make the covers. Um, if not, I will do a shorter bonus class on making the covers themselves. Um, 
just the textile ones. Like I said, I don't do the leather. Um, a third option for covers is paper, but that's usually combined with leather. Um, so you do like paper for this part and then leather for, you know, key areas around the spine and the edges. Um, there's a fancy name for that and, and I honestly don't know how to pronounce it, so <laughs> I'm not going to try. Um, so, like I said, hopefully that was helpful and informative. Um, feel free to check the blog. I've got a couple of posts on kind of the same thing, but uh, with pictures. So hopefully between the two, things will be explained reasonably well and you can figure it out. And if you're interested in a more hands-on but still virtual like workshop where you get your own supplies and I coach you through making a book, let me know and I'll see about trying to do that. It will be a, it will be a longer one because, or in fits and starts as we wait for glue to dry, depending on how you want to do it. So thank you all for attending.